right? I mean, we're spending multiple chapters talking about it, and a whole lot of business is related to contracts. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the elements of a contract, uh, and then focus in on um, the first two elements of a contract, and also talk about the objective theory of contracts, and we'll even spend a little time on e-contracts. Contracts, same law, uh, some additional law to that uh, take place on the internet. So we talked about different sources of law in the past, and a lot of law relating to contracts is the common law. Common law comes from what? Seems like we keep reviewing things. Where's the common law come from? No. Nope. What's that? Laws of the past. Mm, sure. Where does common law come from? What's another word for common law? Yes, case law. Good. Um, common law comes from cases that are decided over time. And so there's a big body of case law out there that deals with contracts and people who breach them and the remedies that are available. Now, there, there are some attempts to uh, make the law more uniform in this area. For example, contracts for the sale of goods and the UCC or Uniform Commercial Code. But generally, if it's not addressed by the UCC, there's a bunch of common law out there. Contracts are really important to business because it outlines the rights and duties of the parties. And as a result of that, people can look back to the contract. And that makes things more stable and predictable. It must be true. It's on the slide. So, I mean, if you, if you think about it, though, if parties were left to their memory to try to recall what they agreed to, this can be a problem. This is why you like to have contracts in writing. But what you found in the chapter, hopefully, is that not every contract has to be in writing to be enforceable. Right? How many of you read Chapter 8? Oh, my goodness. Look at all the hands in the class go up like that. That is amazing. Thank you. All right. The parties to a contract, just like other places in the uh, course, ORs are usually the one doing it. E's are usually the one that's done, too. So promisor is the one making the promise. The promisee is the one accepting the promise. Some contracts, there's a mutual exchange of promises. Sometimes only one side is making a promise. These are their official names. There's also a presumption as parties make their promise that they're doing it in good faith if we're talking about commercial agreements. Now, what is a contract? Oops, didn't mean to go that fast. A contract is more than an agreement. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. See, we agreed and that wasn't a contract. So not every agreement that you reach is considered a contract. Only those that are enforceable in court are going to be contracts. They involve two or more parties. A lot of times we'll talk about both parties or buyer and seller, but there could be multiple parties. There could be more than two. But you don't contract with yourself. You make promises to yourself. Like, I promise from this day forward, today's my birthday, by the way. If you want, no, please don't sing me happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Um, so... I might say, from this day forward, right after I eat my birthday cake, which I hope to get, um, I will eat better. Well, then what happens if I don't do that? Am I sue myself for breach? No. So you need at least two parties. Uh, and a failure to perform what you promised to perform under a contract with someone else is called a breach of the contract. And if the other party breached and you're the innocent or non-breaching party, you could sue for damages. And like we talked about before when we talked about damages, usually trying to make you whole, however much you're out for uh, as a result of the breach of the contract. Then there's this new idea of the objective theory of contracts. 
Basically, courts, because these, this is largely case law, when they take a look at breach of contract actions, they apply this reasonable person standard. They say, well, we're not really concerned about what the parties may have thought at the time. We're concerned with what they did and what they wrote at the time. So if the price says $10,000, we don't want to hear testimony about what somebody thought the price really was. We can look at the contract and see what the parties agree and give it its objective plain meaning. So courts will look at what the parties, how the parties acted as if there was a contract or maybe that there wasn't a contract. All right, to have a contract, you need these four elements. Agreement consideration, capacity, and legality. And we'll go into more detail with each one of these elements, but generally on this slide, an agreement has two parts. What are they? Anybody pick that up? Offer and acceptance. Good. So um, one party is making an offer, the other party accepts that offer, and they accept exactly what was offered, and then they have agreement. The law likes to, likes to call this the meeting of the minds, which I always picture a couple brains walking out and shaking hands with each other. Hello there, nice to meet you, mind. Um, now basically, that you and I, if we're entering into an agreement, we only have agreement if we agree. If we're both thinking the same thing, we're both agreeing to the same thing. The second element is consideration. What is consideration? Anybody pick that up from the reading? Please just raise your hands. Promises made by the parties must be supported by legally sufficient and bargained for consideration. Okay, so, so value must be promised. Yes, value. So consideration is bargained for value. Now why don't they just say money? It's not always money. It's not always. So it could be something else. It could be a service. It could be another good. So basically, you're not giving it away, you're getting something in return. Then capacity. Capacity actually has a couple elements, and I'm not sure how clear the book is about this, so this is a good one to, to make a note of. One thing capacity has to do with is your mental capacity to contract. And so if you think about that, there are a number of things that could affect your mental capacity. Like what? Are you insane enough to make this? Are you asking me? Are you asking me if I'm insane? No, I'm not. You're a minor? Right. So mental capacity certainly would be one. Minor would be another one. Do minors have the capacity to enter into contracts? Generally, they do. A lot of people think they don't. But a lot of contracts, minors do have the capacity to enter into. Some contracts, they can't. What? Sure. Why not? Uh, those business instructors don't know what the heck they're talking about. Well, that's a different issue. That's right. There's a contract. But why would, why would you you sold them a moped. It's theirs. They're driving around. You don't like rip them off of it and go, give me that back. You're a minor. You can't have it. No, the devil was that the minor came back and was like, give my money back. You bet. To give it back That's right. Yes. That's a different issue. There was a contract. Okay, so here's the deal. Minors can contract, but they can also get out of them. What's that? What's the, point? the point is don't sell to minors. <laughs> Right, but I mean, think about it. Has any, have any of you been a, uh, a minor and entered into a contract? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Music. Yes, some of you are often and say no way. Others. Right. So I yell out, my neighbor kid, "Hey, I'll give you money if you mow my lawn." He comes and mows my lawn, and then later I'm like, "Ah ha! You're only 17. I'm not paying you. I can't. I have a contract with him." Now, but to your point, don't get the two confused. Minors can contract, in fact, there's a slide, and it comes from the textbook where it says minors can contract for anything an adult can. I disagree with that. There's something minors can't do. Most things they can. Like, what, what could, what's against the law for a minor to do? So they can't buy alcohol. So they can't contract for that. 
for themselves or on behalf of somebody else. They can't buy cigarettes, right? It's been a long time since I was a minor. I'm reflecting on that today. Right? So what other types of things would be illegal for a minor to do? Okay, let's not go there. Good thing the microphone didn't pick that up. Yes. Well, some of those things are illegal even as an adult to contract for. <laughs> so, yes, uh, minors can enter into a contract. They can, in most cases, get out. That's why if you were a minor and you contracted, a lot of times they don't want just your name on the contract. They want someone else as another party who's not a minor to enter into the contract. Co-signers. Or maybe they just have, the, you're on, who, who had a cell phone as a minor? They didn't make cell phones when I was a minor, but. Actually did. I had this really cool bag phone. It was awesome. <laughs> you ever seen one of those things? Man, I thought I was cool. Oh, yeah. I thought I was cool. Right. So sometimes you, you're actually on someone else's plan or when they uh, had you get the contract, they had your parent or somebody on it. But, yes, minors can contract. So don't believe anything those other business instructors tell you. All right. Um, so capacity, one, intoxication. Like we learned, you know, in the, in the criminal area, it's not usually a defense to argue I was too intoxicated, so that's why I made a bad decision to drive. But in the contract, if you could actually establish that you were too intoxicated to know what you were doing, that would affect your capacity, right? What was the case in your chapter? The, the drunk farmers, right? Lucy V. Zimmer. Lucy's a guy, by the way. But. I didn't understand the outcome. <laughs> you didn't? Why not? Because they held him to it. Yes, they did. Why? Because the question is not whether you're drunk or not. The question is whether you have the capacity or not. And the court said, you're saying subjectively that you were kidding, you were bragging, you were drunk. But objectively, you wrote it out. You had a witness. Your wife was there. Uh, the circumstances say, looks like you were fine. You, you had all the terms. So objectively, not being there, not being at the party, it looks like you guys knew what you're doing, and now you're just having a little buyer's, seller's remorse in that case. That's, that's how you get there. So it's not an automatic rule. If you're drunk, then you can't contract. I mean, think of how many three martini lunches there are out there. And if every time you just drink up, sign, and then say, ooh, I was drinking, uh, the question is, did you have the mental capacity at the time to enter into the contract? Which can be a challenge to prove whether you did or you didn't. If you're so drunk you didn't know what you're doing, how do you recall what you did? That can be a tough one. So your mental capacity is one of those. The other is whether you're the right party. Anybody need a new car in here? Oh, you're all set, huh? Okay, you need a new car. So let's say over the weekend I find this nice car. What kind of car do you like? Anything that runs. Let's say I find a brand new Mustang, because I like Mustangs, right? And so you come into class today, I'm like, I got you a new car. You're like, that's awesome. I needed one. Thank you. And I'm like, oh, oh no, I didn't buy it. I contracted for you. You've got to pay for it. <laughs> right? I don't have the capacity to contract on anyone else's behalf unless you gave it to me. Could I be an agent for one of you? Sure, but other than that, I don't have the capacity to, to sign things on your behalf and enter into contracts for you. So being the right party. It's like selling to a corporation. Does not net, you you got to make sure you're dealing with who has the authority to do it. And then finally, legality. Some contracts are not contracts because they're illegal. Like, let's say you all um, decided that you were unhappy with uh, the quiz score, which I don't know why, but let's say you are, and uh, you contract to have me killed, <laughs> right? You, you, you pull your money together, you get it in writing, you, fi you find like one of the best contract killers in this area, and you put it all out, and the guy's like, hey, geez, I'd do that for free, but if you got to pay me, okay. And then you sign it, right? And then he takes your money or she, and doesn't do it. So now you're all upset because it's a breach of contract, right? <laughs> exactly. 
So you go to court and you're like, judge, enforce the contract. Well, for the judge to enforce that contract, what would the judge have to make happen? I have to be killed, and the court can't do that. So if a contract is an enforceable contract, that one isn't going to work. It's illegal from the start. It's a void contract, which is kind of an oxymoron. That doesn't mean that's a bad name someone calls you. That means it's kind of conflicting, like void contract really means no contract. It's not a contract from the start. Now, there are some defenses to enforceability of the contract, looking at the front end of a contract. Remember, like, there was defenses for torts, defenses for crimes. Now here we are in the contract area. One is that genuineness of assent. We didn't have a meeting of the minds. We didn't have an agreement about the same thing. Let's say I say, I'll sell you Fluffy, my dog, over here in the corner. You're like, I'll buy Fluffy. Turns out Fluffy's dead. You know, it's just kind of stiff sitting over there in the corner. I'm sorry if you have a dog named Fluffy. But neither one of us knows that at the time. We don't have a meeting of the minds. We both thought we agreed to buy a live dog, and the dog's not anymore. Now I'm going to get in trouble for using animal cruelty in my class. To come up with something else. All right. Uh, another one is form. So not all contracts have to be in writing, but some contracts do, and the fact that they're not could be a defense. Like a contract to buy real property. That should be in writing. Why? Right. I mean, one thing is you want to make sure it's the right property. You want to make sure that it's clear that it's now your property. It's like chain of title. Who owns it now? And so one argument is uh, we don't have an agreement because the agreement about real property has to be in writing, and it wasn't. So as we form a contract, here's some different ways of looking at categories of contracts. I'll go into more detail about each one of these. Uh, one way of looking at contracts is bilateral versus unilateral. Uni means what? One, like in uni cycle. By means two. Two what? They can't hear you on the recording. I want I want you all to shout out so they know how smart you are. Two what? Promises. Promises. Good. My last class said parties, so we're redoing the video. <laughs> I'm gonna be in so much trouble. So. Um, a promise for a promise. So you go out and you buy a car. You promise to buy it, they promise to sell you. The moment the promises are exchanged, there's a contract. You fail to pay, they fail to deliver, breach of contract. Any other provision that they promise to perform, they fail to perform it, that's considered a breach. Unilateral contract works a little differently. I mentioned I was vacationing this weekend. I didn't get a chance to mow the lawn. And so on my way out this morning, I yelled over at the neighbor kid, I'll give you five bucks if you mow my lawn. He's only five. He doesn't know better. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, no, he's like, woohoo. I said, I will give you five bucks if you what? Mow my lawn. That's an act. Now, what if he yells over, I promise. Is that what I want? No. Um, you can only, I'd write this down somewhere if I were you. You can only accept an offer to enter in a unilateral contract by doing. You can't accept it by promising to do something. It's not the same. I invited him to mow my lawn, not to promise he'd mow my lawn. Why is this important? I get home at the end of the day. It's not mowed. Did he breach the contract? No, no he didn't because he chose not to. What if I say, I promise to give you five bucks if you mow my lawn by five o'clock. I get home at 5.01, the lawn's not mowed. Did he breach the contract? No, he didn't. He didn't accept. I'm not supposed to be a trick. You can only accept by doing it, and you could choose not to do it if you wanted to. Now, let's say he starts doing it and he does a really crappy job because he's five and he can't even really reach the handle. Right? I mean, I could sue him. You guys could see me suing him, right, for not doing a good job. Um, or you guys probably see me out there with a written contract making him sign it. 
Um, all right, formal versus informal. And we'll go into a little more detail about bilateral and unilateral contracts. Um, don't think formal means written, informal means oral. A lot of people think that. That's not what it means. Most contracts are informal, implied, oral, and written. Only contracts that have to be in a special form are formal contracts. So if there's a statute that says this isn't a contract unless it's in this specific form, an example they give you is um, under seal or um, possibly these days notarized. I'm not sure how many wax seals I've seen on contracts these days. but um, That doesn't mean every time you notarize a contract it's formal. If the law says it has to be in order for it to be a contract, that makes it formal. And then over on the right, express versus implied. Express means what? And how could that be? Two ways that could be. Words could be written and or oral, right? So when we talk about express contracts, we're talking about all oral or written contracts. And when we talk about implied and fact contracts, we mean not a written agreement, not an oral agreement. We mean implied from the facts, the conduct of the parties, the facts surrounding the transaction. Now, don't get me wrong. It's possible that in the conduct or circumstances surrounding the transaction that somebody says something or somebody writes something. But what I'm saying for an implied fact contract, there has to be the agreement is formed by the conduct. So let's say I walk into the coffee shop. Oh, I did last night. I stopped into Meyer. I like to go there because I can get me some Starbucks coffee on the way out. And so I said, I'll have mine. And I gave them my special order I always give them. And they uh, fix it. And then I grab it and start walking out. Now notice I said something. And... Um, I did something. Isn't it implied that when I order the coffee, I'm going to pay for it? I didn't say, I hereby offer to pay you this amount of money if you make me this. Right? I just walked up and ordered it, and they expect that I'm going to pay. Try this if you don't believe me. Go to Meyer, walk in, pile your cart full of stuff, go up to the uh, checkout, and then if somebody tries to talk to you, just ignore them. So you don't want to do anything to make them think that you want to buy the stuff. Then after they ring it all up and bag it all up, and they ask you, you know, they're like, that'll be $500 or whatever. Then go, I never said I wanted it. And see what they say. <laughs> Just try it. Why are the people behind you do? Right, right, right. Why are you here? Why did you come in the store? Why did you put all this stuff in the cart? Why did you walk through here? I mean, that's just the way it works. I mean, this, this will really flip them out, too. Pull up with your cart and go, I hereby offer to purchase the groceries in this cart. <laughs> and see what they do. I go, okay. Uh, I don't want to get someone down here quick. That's right. Yeah, who knows. Um, or better yet, if you work, does anybody work in that type of environment? Like retail at all? I work at Meyer. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> so if somebody comes up, say... Uh, would you like to purchase that to them and see what they're like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I'm standing here. And then, and then, and then whip out a piece of paper like a written contract. Okay, then sign here. I mean, that usually doesn't happen. So my point is, a lot of what we do is implied. I mean, I when I walk up to a vending machine, I always say, "I offer to buy a coke from you," but it doesn't talk back to me. <laughs> All right, so a little more detail about bilateral versus unilateral. As I said earlier, bilateral is an exchange of promises, and it's formed from the moment that the promises are made. So let, back to that kid. Let's say, well, let's say he's at least 18, and I get him to sign a written contract to mow my lawn all summer. So anytime I don't pay him or he doesn't mow, that's a breach. Uh, 
when I made the offer to pay him for mowing for the whole summer, I am the offeror. I made the offer to him, he's the offeree. Offerees have to know about offers to accept them. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. And then unilateral contracts. Uh, this pretty much says there's a couple things on here that are new. The first is lotteries as an example of a unilateral contract. Why is a lottery example of a unilateral contract? Like, I don't know. It's your example, not mine. So you got to get the winning ticket for valid? Right. Because they don't want you to call them and say, you know, I was thinking about playing a lotto, and I thought of these numbers. Will you pay me? They don't want that. They don't want you to even call and say, I got the winning ticket. Trust me. They offer to pay the person who shows up in person with the winning ticket and does whatever else. So short of that performance, there's no agreement, and they don't have to pay. Wouldn't it be cool if you could walk in, buy a lotto ticket, and then say, give me my money? just doesn't work that way. I, I haven't ever purchased a lottery ticket, but I assume that. No. I, just, I know I would never win. Um, revocation of offers. So the common law rule is that you could revoke your offer any time before somebody accepted it. That may not mean a lot to you. Let's try this one. Let's say you decide to sell your car on your front lawn. Put it out there. You put a sign in that says for sale. When could you decide not to sell it? Are you stuck with it? You put it out there, you're stuck, you have to sell it? No. You could, until somebody buys it, you could decide you don't want to sell it, right? So be, before somebody accepts the offer, you could remove the car, remove the sign, right? What if like a week later somebody shows up and you're like, you know that car you had for sale for this price? I want it. Sorry, not for sale. So that someone else already can't have it. So that's the... Common law view, you could revoke an offer any time prior to acceptance. Now, there's a little modification to that. Notice the modern view. Let's say I got the five-year-old next door mowing my lawn. He gets almost all the way done. He's got all the hard parts, and I say, I revoke my offer. I can't do that. So the modern view is in unilateral situations here that once the other party has started to substantially perform, then they ought to be able to finish. So they can, what would you think that would be in the case of mowing my lawn? How far does the kid need to get before he's substantially performed? Done. I don't, I don't know if he has to get done. I, I might even say less than that. I mean, if he goes and get gas, gets the lawn mower, starts mowing, then I'm like, ha, hey, I changed my mind. I think he ought to be able to finish. So, yeah. And formal versus informal, we already talked about that one. Express versus implied. We didn't talk about the detail of this one. We did, really. Trust me, we did talk about it. Uh, implied, in fact, contract, you need three things. If you're looking at a scenario, one of these is missing, not implied, in fact. So I had a buddy of mine, we were jogging, and uh, he said he was at work, and when he came home, there was a bill from True Green on his doorknob. He said, I didn't ask for it. Now, when True Green sprayed his lawn, do you think they meant to provide the service? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you think they expected to get paid? Yeah. yeah, I don't think it was national spray everybody's lawn for free day. Right? So, but what's the problem? He didn't know about it. He didn't get a chance to even reject it. I mean, if we didn't have a rule like this, people would just run around paint houses and ask for money for it. Right? Which can sometimes be a negative thing. Like, is it always a good idea to get your lawn sprayed? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe it's the reason you don't want that happening. Or your house painted. Let's say you have a brick house. Okay, that's a bad example. But, I mean, you may come home and go, wow, that's ugly. Who did that? And then it's like, well, we messed up. We went to the wrong address. Do you think that happens? Oh, it's happened to you? 
Yeah. There you go. Hmm, maybe there's. No, I won't say anything defamatory about True Green. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it could happen. There's a lot of green stuff. You're not sure where you're spraying. Um, I had a client come to me and like, um, I got my driveway paved. I'm like, awesome, that's good. And he's like, I didn't ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody showed up and like, N -n 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 -n. you know, it's a good idea to check to make sure you're at the right place before you start paving driveways. So, I mean, like you could say, I didn't want it paved. Or, I mean, I guess that'd be nice to have it paved, but what if it's like really nice, I don't know, I don't know, like what if they do something really bad to your house, you didn't want it in the first place. So you need to have the opportunity to reject. Now what if my buddy was sitting on the front porch, he watched a true green pull up, spray his whole lawn, and then he bring the bill, he's like, ah, I didn't ask for that. <laughs> right, well then I think, he didn't, stop he didn't stop him. I think then in that case he should have to pay. He wouldn't do that. All right, and that, that case is an example of implied in fact contract where, um, you know, sometimes the question is, uh, can there be changes to a contract? Uh, one of the common situations where this comes up is uh, in builders. You know, they're building a house and then somebody asks for a change. Um, is it possible that you could do some of this orally? Sure, but it's a real good idea to have it in writing. Because later somebody's going to say, oh, I didn't want that, or I wanted it, but I didn't think I had to pay for it. Okay, my parents had their house. Well, they have burned down. They got a new house built. Mm -hmm. And the builder decided the house looked better with the deck on it. And they decided to put the deck on the back. And charged them more money. Yeah, but we did not pay it because it's like, in this, it's not designed to have a deck on it. So, you know, you basically had a deck on there for free. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so yeah, sometimes they just get excited overboard a little bit yeah um, executed versus executory executed means all sides have done everything they're supposed to notice it says both sides but I think there could be more than two parties so when everyone's done everything an executed contract is done there's nothing left to be done an executory contract is when at least one party has at least one thing left to do I was telling my last class, because I am old, I've been able to pay off a couple of vehicles. And, you know, I paid on them for a while. And at the end, it was still executory because the other side still had something they had to do. What did they have to do? All right, they had to give me clear title. I was reminded of this. I was looking through um, our important papers for my son's birth certificate. He is ours. And um, I saw the titles in there. I'm like, oh, I wanted to hug him. Like, it's just, it's hard getting old, but it's nice if you pay something off, you know. One time I got um, title to a vehicle I was leasing. You know how leases work? Like it's someone else's property, you pay them, then you got to give it back unless you buy it. And they sent me the title in my name. Oh, thank you. <laughs> then, they, then they wrote me a letter like, oops, we messed up. I gave it back. All right. Contract enforceability. You, you see that word in the chapter, in whether a contract is enforceable or not. So under valid contracts, contracts that have all the elements, valid contracts are enforceable when there isn't a legal defense that can be raised in court. So you go to court. A con the, the judge says, yep, we can enforce this contract. No problem. An unenforceable contract is a valid contract, but the court can't enforce it. It says there's some legal defense. It was in writing when or it was not in writing when it should have been, or whatever the defense is. We mentioned, uh, you know, genuineness of assent as another argument. And then there's the middle, voidable. This one gets people all the time. Avoidable contract is a valid contract. But for some reason, one of the parties can get out of it. What's it called when you try to get out of a valid contract usually? We already mentioned what it was. Yes, breach. It's called a breach if you get it, try to get out of a valid contract. But 
if you have a right to get out of a valid contract, it makes a contract voidable. What's well, one thing we already mentioned, an example of a situation where a person could enter into a contract but then back out of it? Illegal. Being a minor. Illegal is different. We're getting to that one in a minute. Right, you could have a contract that's valid and it has a provision in it that says if this happens, then one of the parties could back out. The other party doesn't produce enough. The other party is bankrupt, whatever it, it is. I heard this morning that Blockbuster is going through bankruptcy. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, for years now, I've been like, how come they haven't been in bankruptcy? But they're a little behind the times. Um, so voidable means it is a valid contract. It's just one of the parties could back out. Minors is an example. Conditions on a contract is another example. Uh, and then there's void contracts, which is kind of a contradiction. Void contract means no contract, not a contract to start with. Illegal contracts are one type of void contract. What would another type be? Um, that's probably the biggest one. Um, there may be situations where um, it's not against the law to do it, but the court... Uh, would say it's not a contract because um, it's against public policy to enforce that kind of provision or something. <clears throat> well, insanity, I would say the answer is it depends. But to your question, that's a good point, to your question, I'm declared mentally incompetent by a court. I'm not. I'm just using this as an example. Some of you have questioned that already. But let's say that um, I've been suffering from dementia and uh, every time somebody calls me at home, I, I buy whatever it is. You know, I got a brick house, they're selling siding, I'm like, I want it, you know. And then finally, the family gets together and they're like, yeah, ye, there's something going on here. They go to court, they get a guardianship established over me and the court declares that I lack the capacity to enter into contracts. Well, then from that point forward, that's a good example of where that contract, if I tried to contract, it'd be void. The guardian could, but from that point forward, any contract I try to enter into um, would be void. Why? What is it missing? It's missing one of the elements. Which one? Capacity. I lack the capacity because I'm insane. Now, notice that's different than... I'm insane at the time I'm contracted, but I haven't been declared such by the court. Is it is that possible? Like say I contracted by citing for my brick house and then afterwards the court declares that I was incompetent at the time, then that's a voidable contract. I see some blank stares. Well, as long as it was at the time, right? The question is always at the time. Yeah. The question always is, at the time I enter into contract, what capacity did I have? But the, the difference in the example is, in, in the void contract example, before I enter into the contract, I'm declared incompetent. So then any attempt to enter into the contract would be a void contract, wouldn't be a contract. But in the example I just gave you, you know, I enter into the contract, and then later the court says, you know, you, you enter into a contract to buy all the cars on a, on a car lot because you thought you were the prince of whatever, mm -hmm. right? Well, then, that means any contract afterwards would be void. Any contract before, if it could be established at the time you lacked the capacity, it would be voidable. Voidable is, think about it, voidable means you could get out of it, but it means you could also stay in it. Is it possible that I made a good deal while I was lacking the mental capacity? Yeah. yeah. When I think about being intoxicated, it's possible that later you could go, you know what, I wasn't of the right state of mind, but it looks like I did pretty good. <laughs> right. So the question is always, what was my capacity at the time? And with that case of being declared incompetent, did it happen before or afterwards? All right, so the three V's, just as a review, valid, voidable, and void. Void contract means no contract. Voidable means a valid contract you can back out of, and valid means it's got all of the elements.
Somebody give me an example of a voidable contract. Voidable. Yeah. Like you said, dementia. Um, man lives a coin mm -hmm. and is suffering from dementia, but mm -hmm. hasn't had his family has interceded. Someone comes to the house and say, you need a new room. Right. And he, well, yeah. Not if you say I do, room. I do, right? right. <laughs> and then later it turns out that at the time he contracted, he didn't understand. understand. Yeah. That's an example. All right, so I, I asked for that because now I'm going to talk about a, a situation where it's not a contract. So quasi-contract is a remedy you get from a court when there's no actual contract. Notice the only, we've been talking about the way contracts get formed. This is not a contract that gets formed by the parties. This is a contract that the court whips up afterwards as it says on the slide, to avoid unjust enrichment. So if you're wondering what would be a good example, don't look in the book. The example in the book is the stupidest example. <laughs> <laughs> Not that mine are much better, but the example in the book is vacationing physician, driving down the road, sees somebody on the side of the road unconscious, renders them aid, and then slaps a bill on their chest, apparently. <laughs> okay, I added the last part, but... That would be the same Right, it just seems like, I mean, I think the better example is hospitals. I mean, that's what they do, right? They treat people who might be unconscious, and they expect to get paid when they do it. Well, I'd like to say I'm um, excited about contract law, as you all should be, and um, I start flailing around up front here, and I hit the wall and knock myself unconscious. Back when I was younger, I used to just fall over and do this. I got in trouble one time because I was down on the floor screaming, and... Somebody came to the door and they said, where's your instructor? And everybody pointed down here. <laughs> so let's say I'm down here on the ground. I want to make sure the recording gets this. And I'm unconscious. I've knocked myself out. What are you going to do? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you leave, you roll me, take my wallet. <laughs> Um, one of you says, do CPR, the other says, he's drinking coffee, he's got bad breath. And so <laughs> you decide to take me over to the hospital, right? It's right across the street. You roll me in there, and they ask me, sir, would you like medical treatment? And I respond with, <laughs> I'm unconscious. And they're like, I know, let's get him to sign something. Right? I can't sign anything. I'm unconscious. And they're like, I know, I know. There's this law. Let's watch him and see if he engages in any conduct, which implies he wants to enter into contract. Uh, you know, maybe I'm bleeding, and they're like, ooh, there's conduct. They're like, I'm not doing anything. I'm unconscious. So they render me treatment, and you're all anxiously waiting. Right? And then I come to, and I'm like, let's get back to class. And you're, like, you're all like, yahoo, let's do it. And they're like, well, sir, sir, you have to pay. And I go, oh, this is a good teachable moment here. I'm a lawyer. This is my class, and I know the law. I did not enter into a contract with you. I don't have to pay. Am I right? Well, well I'm here, and I'm right. I'm wrong. I said, there's no contract. Am I right? No, not yet. Haven't been to court. It's kind of implied. No, it's not. It's not. I just got through telling you there's no contract. I, it can't be implied, in fact. I didn't do anything. I was unconscious. I didn't say anything to enter into contract. I didn't do anything to enter contract. I didn't write anything to enter into contract. There is no contract. I'm right. There's no contract yet. There's no contract yet. And there's only giving me a contract when the hospital takes me to court and I say, Your Honor, there isn't any contract. And the court says, You know what? You're right. But there's this remedy that we can put into place where we whip up a fictional contract between you, and the reason we do that is to protect you and them. We protect them because they get paid. We protect you because they don't have to wait around for you to come to. Yeah. So just to throw a twist in there, what about the people who suffer from, say, narcolepsy? <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> 
So go on, like you're saying, while they're asleep? Exactly. Suppose you have narcolepsy and you fall out. We don't want this and we transport you to the hospital. There's nothing wrong with you. Oh, you're saying they give me treatment and I don't need it? Yeah, I don't know if that twist will help us understand the idea of quasi-contract. Because, <laughs> I mean, you can get into, you know, can someone else give consent for your treatment? Do you really need the treatment? And all those type of questions. I mean, I think your argument goes to, was I really unjustly enriched when I got treatment I didn't really need? So I suppose that's my argument is, court, you shouldn't use your equitable powers here because we're not avoiding unjust enrichment. They did something to me they didn't need to do. What if they made me worse? They're like, we need to be paid. Paid for what? You harmed him. You didn't help him. Right? So, yeah, I suppose that could be an issue. All right. So, if you see a scenario, and in the scenario there's a contract, then you're not going to get quasi-contract because you only get quasi-contract from a court afterwards when there was no actual contract. All right, so let's look at the elements of a contract in more detail. Agreement. Remember we said agreement is an offer and acceptance. Let's focus first on the offer. The offer has to be serious and objective. And we were mentioning case 8.2, Lucy B. Zimmer, earlier. Um, the court's going to look at the objective facts rather than what one of the parties says to try to avoid the contract. So you say that you're intoxicated and you didn't really mean it, but objectively it looks like you did. Is it possible to avoid a contract by claiming you were voluntarily intoxicated? Yes. Not so much with crimes, but in contract law, if you can show that you were intoxicated and the reason was because you intoxicated yourself, if you can establish you lack the capacity, the court may let you out of the contract. All right. Involuntary. Right. I mean, it, clearly, I think if it's involuntary, I, your question is, is there such thing? Sure. You could um, get a bad brownie. You could, you could, your drink could be spiked with some kind of drug. You could be forced to drink. A lot of people say that, but I don't know how often that happens. But it does. It does. Um... Serious intention. These, this is more a list of things that aren't. So your opinion isn't an offer. Negotiations aren't offers. Even agreeing that you'll agree sometime in the future isn't good enough. Think about an ad in the newspaper. Let's say I want to sell my Jeep. Jeep for sale, $5,000. And then five people call me back and say I accept. Do I have to sell it to all of them? No. <laughs> yeah, you can all share. You know, it's, it's a day of the week. You get to drive it. So it's an invitation for someone to offer me. And they call and I get to pick who I sell it to. All right. So an offer has to be definite. You know, my Jeep for $5,000. It's got to be definite enough for another party to know what they're accepting. And it has to be communicated to the offer E, which seems like a no-brainer, but let's just give an example. Let's say uh, I got a kid. He likes to wander around. It's always taken off. And um, I put up a reward. Can't find him. Been lost for a few days. So put up a reward. Please return my kid. I'll give you five bucks. <laughs> Somebody shows up a few days later with my kid. They're like, we found this kid wandering down by the lake. You want him back? I'm like, mm, okay. So they give him back to me. And then later they learn there was a reward. Then they come back. They're like, can I have the reward? If this says the offer has to be communicated to the offeree before accepting, when they return the kid, they weren't accepting my offer. Right? right. They were just doing it. Probably because they didn't want him. <laughs> He's expensive to feed. Doesn't go to sleep when you tell him to. So you can only accept an offer you know about. All right, revocation of the offer. Remember earlier I was saying you could revoke an offer any time prior to it being accepted, except for that unilateral contract situation we were talking about. 
unless you promise that your offer will remain open. Option contracts is an example. You could pay somebody to agree to sell the land to you if, they want, if you want to buy it at some point in the future. You see a piece of property. You're not sure you want to buy it. But you want to lock it in by having the other party sell you the option to buy it within the next 90 days. So if they're going to sell it, they're going to sell it to you in that time frame. That's called an option contract. Maybe you see that securities, real property. So would that be like a kind of down payment on the... No, that's different, usually. Usually down payment is, I'm contracting, I'm agreeing to buy this, this is just my good faith, you know, initial payment. Like a land contract? A land contract could be another example of a contract for real property that involves putting money down on it. I'm talking about something different. I'm just talking about paying for the right to buy it if you decide to. I would like you're paying them to hold on to it. Yep. And don't sell it to someone else. Well, how long do you have, you have to put that? Whatever you agree with. Yeah, in writing. That's why the statute of fraud says contracts for interest in land should be in writing to be enforceable. Because you, you... Can anybody hear a buzzing? Yeah. Like a phone going off? Okay. Sometimes I hear things in my head and it's not really... <laughs> <laughs> out there so just check in no oh, good Whew. this time all right um, now this one gets a little tricky it's pretty it's pretty clear if you make an offer like if I said to you I'll sell you my Jeep for 5,000 you said no way that'd be a rejection right um, but you can also reject somebody's offer by making a counter offer like if I said I'll sell you my Jeep for 10,000 you said I'd give you five for it that's a rejection and a new offer. Did you see that? I'll sell you my Jeep for 10000 I'd give you five for it. You're in a sense saying, I wouldn't pay you ten, but I would pay you five. That's a rejection of the original $10,000 offer and a new offer. So if I say, I'll sell you my Jeep for 10000 who am I? The offer... Or to you, the offeree, and you say, I give you five for it. Guess yeah. what? You become offeror. You're the offeror, right? You reject the original offer, and you now present a new offer. You're the offeror, I'm the offeree. Now, why is that so important? Let's try that again. I'll sell you my Jeep for 10000 I'll give you five for it. And then I respond with, Nope, I'm, only, I'm not going to do that. Guess what? The original offer is no longer out on the table. That's why it's important to know that a counter offer is a rejection of the original offer. Because you're like, okay, I'll give you ten. Too late, not there anymore. Yeah. So does the counter offer automatically get rid of the first offer? Counter offer counter offer is a rejection of the original offer and a new offer. Um and another thing to talk about in that context is the mirror image rule. So what is an acceptance and what is a rejection and counteroffer? The, the mirror image rule says the acceptance must mirror the offer. If I say I sell you my Jeep for 10000 your response is I'll buy your Jeep for 10000 That is an offer and acceptance. Well, then we have an agreement. But what if I say I'll sell you my Jeep for 10000 you respond I accept for five. That's not mirroring the offer, is it? I mean, wouldn't that be cool if you could trick people? You're like, I accept for one dollar. You can't, you can't do that. That's not really an acceptance, even if you use the word I accept. All right, so sometimes, even though the parties don't reject the offer, the law might terminate the offer. The law steps in. Uh, I was trying to sell my house in Kalamazoo. I contracted with a real estate agent who didn't know what they were doing. Actually, I contracted with a real estate agent who didn't know what they were doing, and then they pulled their mother into it. Her mother was their, her mother was newly licensed, and so I thought I was contracting with one person to do it. And they said, oh, I'm going to have my mom practice on you guys. So I terminated that relationship. But um, it was for a six-month period of time. 
if they couldn't sell my house within that six month period of time, the law would terminate that. So there wasn't any agreement between us. Or I might have the offer open for a period of time. Or let's say um, I offer to sell you my house, but it burns down. You're like, I accept. I don't have a house to sell you anymore. So whatever it is that's the subject of the offer could um, be terminated. Um, or the death or incompetency of the party. I offer to do something for you, but I can't do it now. I'm dead. It's harder to do things after that, right? unless it's irrevocable. I mean, it might be a situation where the estate is now responsible for it. But generally, if I can't perform it, then I can't. So that, that could happen with incompetence or incapacity of the party, too. Or the supervening illegality of, of a contract. I offer to, to do something with you that subsequently becomes illegal to do with you. Sell you some chemicals or something that now are illegal to sell. All right, and then acceptance. Voluntary act mirrors the terms of the offer. The one thing on here that we didn't talk about is silence. Sometimes when parties act like there's a contract, then there is. I offer you to sell my Jeep to you, and you give me the money and take the Jeep. That's a good indi indication that you accept. Okay. Usually an offer can be accepted by any reasonable means. Examples up there. The mail, fax, email. The mail presents an interesting rule. Notice the mailbox rule up there? You can accept an offer by putting something in the mail, and the acceptance is effective as soon as you put it in the mail. If you think about what that means, that means whoever extended the offer may not know that it's been accepted, as it hasn't got to them yet. How would you get around that, according to this slide? You could say, I want it received this way, right? You know, there's other ways you can, would be considered communication of your acceptance. Then you may say, I don't want you to send it to me in the mail. I want you to do one of these other things. Yeah, and that's one of the, accept, the exceptions here. So if it never actually gets put in the mail, if the offer or says, I won't accept it by mail, um, or the offeree rejects. <clears throat> and then all the stuff we've been talking about online, e-contracts. Um, a lot of these things, whether you're talking about a, a paper written contract, an oral contract, an e-contract, you're going to want these things in your contract. Remedies, statute of limitations, how people do the pay, some of the ones that might be different, um, refund and return can be different online. Uh, notice the last one. Anybody ever signed up for some free service? How many of you are on Facebook? Come on, don't be afraid to raise your hand. Okay, so most of you. Um, you provide them with information about yourself. One of the big issues with Facebook has been what can they do with that information? And they've tried to do lots of different things with it. Like your friend is buying a Coke right now and having that show up on your wall or watching this movie or what third party applications have access to your information. <laughs> I mean this you usually agree when you use these applications, that they can have access to this information. There's a bunch of develops, developers out there developing applications for Facebook so they can get your information. Um, so whenever you buy something online, one of the additional questions you have is what do they do with the information you provide to them? Or even if you don't buy it, if you just think, oh, this is a free service, 
Uh, sometimes you should be concerned with what they do with the information they collect. I'm not saying this just happens online. Like my wife always gives me these uh, tags that I'm supposed to use when I go into Meyer or store, you know, scan those. Do you ever notice the coincidence whenever you do that, that you get all kinds of mail about targeted on that? Go into the store, buy diapers. You're going to get a coupon, all kinds of kid stuff. So they do stuff with your information. Uh, also, how disputes will be settled. On the Internet, um, the question can be, which law, which state's law applies, or country? Where do we go if we have a dispute? Um, I may have mentioned eBay before to you. eBay is like, go to some third party and have it resolved electronically. The other issue that comes up is, a lot of online services don't want you to have to read through a whole bunch of stuff before you buy their product. Think about Amazon. In fact, Amazon's on here. Um, just click, you got it, right? They got your information stored in there. The law says as long as they've got a hyperlink or some way for you to get to see all the terms, you don't actually have to see them and read them all and agree to them. If you had the opportunity to, that's good enough. How many people online, when they buy something, they read through all the terms before they buy it? Oh, you see them, maybe. You'll scan them. Like, like okay, like uh, who's paying for shipping, what other costs are associated with this. But a lot of people are like, ah, price is right. Click the button. Don't read through all the terms. A lot of times some of the terms say you'd go to arbitration instead of suing us. Or you'd come here and under our laws, not where you're at under your laws. All right, so here's an example. Um, one of the additional things that comes into play when we're talking about doing things online is how you indicate that you accept the terms or you agree to buy it. In a written contract, maybe your signature. But what does that look like online? Here's an example of a CAPTCHA where there's some kind of picture and and some text and you're supposed to type in what you see to prove that you're a human being not a robot sometimes they have like um, animals or whatever everybody ever seen a kit, kitten captcha like they got little pictures of different animals and they say identify the kitten in the picture or something but, so sometimes it's uh, characters sometimes it's something else but the whole idea is say Yes, this is this person. They really are a person. It's not just some robot or somebody else putting in. So um, some encryption key, some way of verifying your identity, some pen code. Um, anybody do their taxes online? Like you get to the end and they say, you know, what was your taxes last year or something and, you know, pick this pen and all these type of things. And everybody picks one, two, three, four, but anyway. Uh, shrink wrap agreement. How many people buy software in boxes? Yeah, it was one student last class. There's two of this one. I mean, a lot, not that many, a lot of people try to get software for nothing or download it on the internet. Not that many people, what's that? I said legally. Right, yes, lawfully. Some of them do it illegally, but um, we're talking about contracts here, so. Um, so there's a term or contract or agreement inside the box. So some people have challenged that. How can I agree to something I don't know yet? And the courts have said, well, you can open it and you can see it before you install it and accept it, therefore, good enough. The only hitch with that is what, what if you buy software from a store and you take it back unopened, what do they usually say? Can't bring it back. But in terms of these shrink wrap agreements, most courts up you know, say that these these are lawful. You have a choice. You can decide not to install the software. When I install software, I look at it and go, okay, if I agree to this, I get it. If I don't agree to it, I don't get it. And then I read everything in there. All right, e-signatures. You know, this is back to that idea that um, there's been some laws that say Pretty much, we're going to give full force and effect to electronic contracts and signatures. So if you have some system for notarizing or providing encryption keys or some way of identifying the person as the person, 
good enough. We'll take an e-signature as well as we'll take a physical signature. And then UETA. Now, the purpose to UETA is not to create this separate category of e-contracts is treated differently than anything else, but instead to give full force and effect to electronic records, electronic signatures, to remove barriers that are um, in place in electronic commerce. Used to be people would say, won't accept that it, it's digital or won't accept that it, it's not an actual signature. Uh, now it's pretty commonplace to have contracts done online. And this kind of reviewing factors multiple law that relates to that. All right, consideration. We already mentioned that consideration is about exchanging something of value, something that's bargained for. So you have to have both those elements. Legally sufficient value, bargain for exchange. But the new thing this slide adds is that courts usually don't get involved in if it's enough or not. So let's say you pay too much for your car, you go back to the dealer, like, I think I paid too much. What are they going to say? Oh, well. <laughs> that just means we made more money off of you. And the courts aren't going to say, well, you know what, you could have got it better somewhere else, so we'll give you the difference. They don't get involved too much in the adequacy consideration, unless it's totally one-sided and the court doesn't want to enforce it, but typically they won't get involved in it. So situations that lack consideration. It sounds like consideration, it looks like consideration, but it's not really. Um, let's say I contract to have my home built, and the builder comes to me and says, I need 10000 more from you. And I say, for what? And he says, just because I need more money. He already has a pre-existing duty to do it. We've already contracted for it. He can't charge me more to do the same thing. So that would be unsupported by consideration. And that could come up. Like that happened with my builder. My builder, the second one, Unforeseen Difficulties. My builder said, um, the price of trusses has tripled. You've asked for trusses a certain way, and because of some things that have happened down south and availability of wood, they've jacked up the prices of trusses. And I said, bummer. I wasn't going to agree to give him, because if he'd saved money, do you think he would have given me the difference? No. That's just the normal risk associated with doing that kind of stuff. I'm sure he did okay on building my house. Uh, past consideration. Um, Things that have already taken place in the past. We were mentioning that example. Let's say I, I did pay somebody. Now they come back and they ask me for the same thing. Not going to work. What if my neighbor, who's a police officer, comes to me and says, uh, pay me $1,000, I'll guard your house. <laughs> That's pre-existing duty, right? He already has a duty. Actually, he doesn't. He's in a different county, but let's say he did. Or an illusory promise. It sounds a lot like a promise, but it's not really. I promise to buy your property if I want to. I mean, I, like I use the word promise, but that's still not enough. Um, and then settlement of claims. An accord and satisfaction. I could say, um, let's say I, have, I owe money on my credit card. I owe $10,000. Now, I can't pay it. So I contact my credit card company and I say, I'll give you $5,000 right now. They've got some choices, right? They could say, we'll take it because we don't think we're going to get it more. That would be different than what I originally agreed to pay them, right? What if I send my, just send them $5,000? What are they going to do? Bye. They're going to say, thank you. Here's the bill for the rest. You owe us five more. So an accord is, would you take something different than what we originally agreed? And the satisfaction is, ah, yes, we will. Uh, or maybe it's a release. Maybe you could bring a legal claim, or maybe you have some type of legal action that you could bring, but you decide uh, to give up that right. And then the last one that I think is 
kind of a challenge and one you will need for the group activity is called promissory estoppel. So promissory estoppel means you're stopped from getting out of your promise. You make a promise to somebody when you didn't have to. But as a result of that promise, they rely on it to their own detriment. Then it's unfair for you to back out. Let's say I promised my son the land next door to our house. Did I have to do that? No, I just said, I'm going to give you that land. Then he digs a hole and starts building on it. And then I'm like, uh, you know, you didn't give me in consideration for it. I was only gifting it to you. I take it back. This would say, this law would say, nope, too late. It's unfair for you to back out of your promise because he's done what? He's relied on and he's already acted and he's caused some detriment in terms of investing money into the property. So you need those things listed down there. There's a clear and definite promise. Um, when the promise is made, they expect the other party is going to rely on it. The other party does to their detriment. And the courts going to make the party follow through with a promise to prevent uh, injustice or unjust enrichment. Does that make sense?